Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Marion Glavak from the BusyEducator.com website. Today my guest is Harry Wong. Harry Wong is a native of San Francisco and taught middle school and high school science. He has been awarded the Outstanding Secondary Teacher Award, the Science Teacher Achievement Recognition Award, the Outstanding Biology Teacher Award, and the Valley Forge Teacher's Medal. Harry Wong is the most sought after speaker in education today. He has been called Mr. Practicality for his common sense, user-friendly, no-cost approach to managing a classroom for high-level student success. More than a million teachers worldwide have heard his message. With his wife, Rosemary, also an educator, they've written the best-selling book ever in education, The First Days of School, which has sold over three million copies. For more information on Harry's products and services, go to www.effectiveteaching.com or www.harrywong.com. It's my pleasure to welcome my friend and mentor, Harry Wong. Welcome, Harry. Thank you, Marianne. It's good to talk to my dear friend, uh, even though you're way up there in Chile, Canada, and I'm kind of here in Wong, California, but wherever educators gather, it's uh, always a nice, loving, warm gathering. Thank you to all of you who wrote your questions into Marianne. Uh, they totaled single space eight pages, and it would be impossible to answer each one specifically. Uh, it would take days to go through. But in with the questions uh, to many of you. Thank you for your kind words about me and the book. I'm glad it's been able to, uh, I or the book have been able to help you. Marianne and I have had a discussion about these long list of question, uh, questions you have. And I've come to the conclusion that what I would rather do is than to answer each question and perhaps a slight sum of you. I've pulled all of the questions into several categories because the questions, many of them, overlap and duplicate each other. And so I think I can almost answer all the questions uh, by using another tack. I would prefer not to answer the question. I would rather give you examples of other teachers who have solved the very question you want to solve. And then it is my wish that I know you can do it, because you are a professional, that you will do exactly what they have done. And they have looked at my materials or the other people I have furnished as examples, and they have simply tweaked it and changed it and applied it to their classroom. And so while I'm talking, please get some paper and a pencil handy if you wish, because I'm going to give you lots of references that are easily found. Um, I used to answer questions, uh, and somebody would write to me and say, Harry or Dr. Wong, can you tell me what to do? I've got this situation. And many years ago, I would write back, and I would say, why don't you try this, and I would try that. And I'd get a thank you, and then pretty soon they'd write me again. And I'd get another thank you, and pretty soon they'd write me again. And then they would say, it didn't work. Now, all of a sudden, you see, now it's my fault. And if you would read Unit E about people who are victims, you'll understand. And that is why I really no longer answer questions. I'd much rather show you teachers who have solved the problems, and I think you can do it also. So instead of asking, tell me what I'm supposed to do, in my book, I make the statement, what is it that I need to know so that I can do what it is that I need to do. So I'm going to assume that you know what you need to do. So I'm going to share references with to you so that you can then perhaps solve your own problem. And so as I said, we have sorted all the questions into several categories. And the good news is no names will be mentioned. And so Marianne, why don't you um, go ahead with maybe the first category or question. OK, thank you very much, Harry. Well, the first question is, most of the questions have to do with discipline or behavior problems. That was a big, big, big item. I think it covered at least four of the eight pages. Do you have any comments or advice to give teachers? Yeah. Um, Fred Jones is his name. Maybe some of you know him. He's written a very, very good book. And this is what he says. He says, talking 
and movement or transition constitute 80% of the discipline or behavior problems in the classroom. So if I can address my comments to discipline or behavior, uh, I think I can help you solve 80% of your problems. Then uh, <laughs> the rest of you, you can take care of all the other things. Um, I know that some of you have even, I, I know that I feel for all of you. Uh, I can I can feel the frustration in, in, in your questions. Some of you have even gone so far as to name names. I'm not the last name, but you've even named kids. And you've told me about these single kids, and some of you gave me a whole list of kids. Or you've told me about their family or their financial background. And my advice is, please, don't do things to people. It's like, what do I do to this kid? Let me tell you about Don't do things to kids. Because you wouldn't like it if someone did something to you. I'd much rather you be proactive rather than to be a reactive teacher. It's not a case of winning battles and getting people to comply to you. You see, an effective teacher knows how to proactively manage a classroom with procedures. And that's how effective managers run their classrooms. Ineffective teachers will discipline the classroom with threats and punishments and they're expecting to win battles, and they want compliance or else. And so, as I said, I feel for you. I know how some of you are at the end of the day. <laughs> you, want to, you want to say to yourself, I'm going to shave my hair and go into rehab. I think that, uh, some of you are probably saying, oh, I wish I could wake up in the morning and find my principal's picture printed on the side of a milk cart. <laughs> principals, if you're ever listening, I, we're just making fun. Right? You're, you're a wonderful group of people. And I know some of you want to even call in sick. And when the person who monitors the substitute list says, why are you, what's your problem? You say, I'm, I'm suffering from anal glaucoma. And the person says, what's that? And you say, I just can't see dragging my rear end into work today. <laughs> so uh, as I proceed through this, now I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to make an assumption that most of you, if not all of you, have either I, one, read my book, seen my video, or read my columns on teachers.net, and number two, most important, you know what is a procedure, and number two, you know how to teach a procedure. Now, I could tell by reading the questions, the dead giveaway of why some of you are having problems, because you say, well, I have procedures, Harry, and I tell them, and I tell them, and I remind them, and I remind them, and then I don't see the word rehearse. You see, in order to teach a procedure, there is a procedure to teach a procedure. And there are three steps, and it's all in Chapter 20. And you need to teach, the most important thing is you need to rehearse the procedures. Now, the examples that I'm going to give you all come from www.teachers.net. I do not own teachers.net. Uh, it's owned, I think, by two guys in San Diego, California. And Rosemary and I simply write these columns 10 times a year. We've been doing it for over seven years. And we do it with no pay. It's our contribution to education. And we have a style. Our style is we chronicle what successful schools, administrators, and teachers are doing. And we share their success story with all of you out there. Now, granted, these teachers have implemented the work from the first days of school. And so it's my belief that all of you can implement the work from the first days of school or go to these references that I'm going to give you, read how they do it, and then you can do your own. For instance, please write down November 2004. Now, you can find all of these dates in two ways. Either find the June column, which is an archive of all previous columns, or easier than that, on the very home page of teachers.net, you'll see all kinds of things, but you'll see my column. It'll say effective teaching, and that's what Rosemary and I do. We want to help teachers become effective. Just click on that column, and you'll see this month's column, and then go clear to the end, and you'll see an archive of all past columns. Find November 2004. This is an article about Karzim Chichek. He came to America about five years ago from Turkey with a university degree in science, but uh, no teaching credential and limited English capacity. 
He said he looked for a small city to learn English in. I don't know what. I don't know why he picked it, but he picked Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> to learn English, and he uh, enrolled in the University of Tulsa. And while he was there, he saw an ad in the newspaper looking for, a, the school was looking for a science teacher. He said, oh, I have a science degree. So I applied. And he said, lo and behold, I was hired. Now, this is his story. He says, I spent the first three years as a warrior. And that's basically the four or five pages that we got that many of you sent. I know many of you feel you were a warrior. And um, Karzim said, I was a warrior. For three years, I fought them, and they fought me. And then he says, between my third and fourth year, and I was seriously thinking of not even coming back into teaching for my fourth year, I saw this announcement of a free meeting sponsored by the Tulsa Education Foundation, and you were coming into town. So I said, what do I have to lose? So I went over there, and about 850 people in the auditorium listening to you speak. I did not know who you were, but it didn't take me long to have a light bulb moment. I had an inspiration. I had an aha. I had never heard the subject classroom management. I had also never heard the word procedures, but it made so much sense to me. And then this was a Thursday, and I had four days to prepare for my first day of school. So I went home and I prepared my classroom management plan. I prepared my script for the first day of school. And on the first day of school, I walked in with my classroom management plan and my first day of school script, and it was on PowerPoint. And his PowerPoint presentation is available if you will go to teachers.net, November 2004, and where it says click here, his entire presentation will come up. Well, at the end of the fourth year, I get a letter from Karzim. And with a smile on his face, you could read it in the email. He said, I have come to the end of my fourth year. And the wish that I wish my students, and you'll see this at the last slide of his PowerPoint presentation, he wished his students on the first day of school that they would have a wonderful year. He writes to me and he said, I have just had a wonderful year also. And I can't wait to start the next school year. And this was May. And so that's the story of Karzim. Now, if you're wondering what I'm talking about, please go to June 2000. And there you will see the story of Melissa. When I met her, she was Melissa Pantoa. She's now Melissa Boone Han. And she was a teacher outside of Oklahoma City, and I gave a preschool presentation. And at the end of the presentation, Melissa comes up to me and says, Mr. Wong, I'm a brand new teacher. I'm going to begin teaching on Monday as a first-year teacher. And this was Thursday now. And she says, I have something to give you. And she hands me her first day of school script. That's right. All football coaches go into a game having scripted all their plays or, or their first 10, 20 plays. In other words, the problem in education is that we have many teachers who do not have a plan a plan for the class that is announced to the class so the class knows what is the plan. And that's why they come to school every single day saying, what are we going to do today? Why are we doing it? And But what they like is consistency. And that's a word I use in my book. I play that over and over again. What kids want more than anything else is consistency. They don't want surprises. They want a safe room with no yelling or screaming. They just want to know what is going to happen. And so... Melissa shared her script, and I have followed her career for the last eight years. That's right. Half the teachers never make it through their first five years of teaching. She not only has made it through the first five, she's now in her eighth year, and I guarantee she's going to stay in education for the rest of her life. She is now a teacher leader with all kinds of responsibilities. She began with a script. Now go to February 2005. In fact, I just presented with her in North Carolina this past week to a group of people. Whenever I can spring her out of her classroom, I take her with me because she's authentic. By that, I mean she's a, a new teacher. And if I can show an audience that a new teacher can succeed on the very first day of school, uh, she's very convincing because what she does is she shares with the audience for an hour her PowerPoint presentation of what she has for her students on the first day of school. 
and you can find this on February 2005. Her name is Shalanda Soroyer. She's a high school English teacher, and on the first day of school, she said, I was scared to death, but I had a plan. I had spent two months pouring through the first days of school, and I came up with a script, a first day of school plan. And so on the first day of school, I was standing at the doorway greeting my students, always stand at the door greeting the students. They have seven seconds to make an impression of you and what you're going to do that day. She shook their hands, welcomed them into class, and she was nervous and scared. And then she had an eerie feeling. She turned around, looked into her classroom, and breathed a sigh of relief. Her students were all at their desks, all at work, and she had not even begun her first second of her first minute of her first day of her first year as a brand new teacher, and she was already a success. And if you read this column, you'll find out about her other successes and awards that she won in her first and second year of teaching. The next one I want you to go to is September 2001 and September 2005. It's about the same teacher. In September 2001, her name was Sarah Jones. In 2005, she's Sarah John Dahl. We met Sarah John Dahl when a friend of ours told us about her because her daughter was in her class and her daughter was just so happy. And this mother said, and this teacher is using your methods. So we went over to see her, and this was October. This was a brand new teacher who had only been teaching three months. And as we went to her classroom and watched the class, our jaw just dropped. She was so effective, and she's a very quiet, unassuming lady. You could tell the kids were doing the work. They loved her. They knew what to do. There were no problems in the classroom. So what was going on? How did she do it as a brand new teacher? And so when the day came to an end and the students left, we said, Sarah, you're amazing. You're marvelous. How do you do it? And she says, come with me. And she went to her desk and she pulls this binder off the shelf. And she said, I prepared this binder when I graduated from Western Kentucky University. It is my classroom management binder. And then she opens it and she showed us what she did. She showed us sample letters that she sent home. She showed us her daily closing message. She knows how to close a class. She showed us her bell work. She knows how to begin a class with a bell work. You always begin with an assignment on the board every single day with the students knowing where to find it. So they don't come in and say, what are we going to do? They know the procedure as to how to walk in the classroom and get to work. And then she showed us everything else she had in the binder. Well, she's now been in education eight years, and that one binder has now grown to two binders, and she is truly a superior teacher. And then go to March 2005, and you'll see Ed Lucero. Ed Lucero is a veteran teacher, and he was going to quit after 12 years of teaching. And as he tells the story, his wife, Ruby, who teaches special ed, saw this in her husband and handed him a copy of the first days of school, and he said, I read it during the summer, and I had a light bulb moment. I had an inspiration. He said, hey, I'm a high school teacher. I teach business. My students, many of them, most of them are not going to college. Most of them are going out into the world and going to work in a store or an office. And since I teach business, why not just turn my classroom into an office? Because all offices have procedures. So during the summer, he wrote a classroom management plan or an office plan with office or classroom procedures. And this plan is also downloadable if you go to March 2005 and read about the transformation of Ed Lucero. Now, that was four years ago. A month ago, Ed Lucero writes us a letter, and he says, Harry and Rosemary, I just got national board certification. Wow. Here's another one, October 2004. Her name is Robin Zarzor. She is a preschool special ed teacher. Uh-huh. The kids are not even in kindergarten yet. They're ages three to five. And some of them are severely disabled to the point where there must be a nurse with the child 24 hours. And she has them. And her class runs as smooth as can be. So I know some of you may be saying, well, 
how can I have bell work? How can I have things on the board where my kids can't even read? Well, her kids can't read. So how does he do it? Her students sing the procedure. That's right. There is a snack song, a recess song, a lunch song, a good morning song, etc. Read about her. Read about the physical education teachers who don't have a chalkboard and how they get their students to do the work when they walk into the gym. It's in a recent uh, teachers.net column. In fact, it could be this month or last month. I know some of you may listen to this months and years from now, but it's uh, either February or March 2007. You'll see about the high school physical education teachers. And then here's another one, September 2004. It's about Heather Chambers, kindergarten teacher. The column is about how procedures save a teacher's life. One day during her pregnancy, uh, she collapsed, hit her head against the table, was bleeding, and she would have died if the class did not know what to do. She had briefed the classroom on procedures of what to do if this happened to her. They knew instantly what to do, and they saved her life. She had procedures. She had procedures. Okay, so here are some more. Uh, I hope you're taking notes. Uh, let's talk about uh, movement. Uh, movement, and so the first one probably will solve many of your uh, your noise problems because the, the students just know what to do in the classroom. And um, there are there are several examples in the book, The First Days of School, as to procedures you can just very quietly signal when the class gets a little too noisy. There are procedures that you use. I, mean, I just raise my hand, and I'm a high school teacher, and I can have them quiet. Other people will hit a little chime. Uh, I know some people simply say, give me five, please. And many people use that procedure. I know a teacher who uses salami, which means stop and look at me. But the point is, what is your procedure, and do you rehearse and rehearse and rehearse? Okay, let's talk about movement or transition. But let's start clear at the beginning. How about transition into the school? Look on page 46 of the first days of school. There is a school district illustrated that every year has a first day of school celebration. Picture, if you will, kindergarten students who come to school for the very first time in their life are invited to the school before the first day of school for a quote-unquote celebration where they are welcome, they're fed, the parents are with them, they can get a tour of the school, they get to meet the teacher that they're going to have, and the teacher takes them to their classroom and says, this is my name, and may even say, and when you come to school on Monday, look for me. I'm going to be wearing the same outfit so you can spot me. How wonderful. What a wonderful way to welcome people as they transition. And then how about Houghton, Louisiana High School? They have the same thing. They have a Camp Buccaneer where they invite students who are freshmen to school a week before and even furnish bus rides if you need. And in the morning, they're in the auditorium and they're taught the school yell, the school song, the spirit this, spirit that. They're introduced to everyone on their staff. They're given their schedule and their locker and their locker number. They're taken on a tour of the school. They get to meet the teacher. They get to see the cafeteria. They are shown how to use the cafeteria. And then they are broken up into about six or seven groups. And these groups rotate. And one group could be how to stay out of trouble. Another one would be how to study and earn good grades. Another one would be get into the spirit at Houghton High School. And so during the transition, these kids come to school and no one makes fun of them on the first day of school. Now go to December 2001, teachers.net, and read about Jeannie Bayless. Some of you wrote and said you don't have your own classroom, you have to move from room to room, or the kids come to you. No problem at all. Jeannie Bayless does not have her own classroom. She's an art resource teacher. From K to 6, the students come to her classroom one class at a time. The teacher brings the students down to Jeannie Bayless's class, and she has them for one hour. And it takes her two weeks to cycle through the entire school. So the kids don't see her. She doesn't see the kids for two hours, for two weeks. And yet, when they come, she greets them in the hallway. That's right. You don't let them in your classroom. They are greeted in the hallway. They're all lined up. She smiles at them and tells them how wonderful it is that they're standing in line. 
no, no, not touching each other. And you can see on their eager faces, they can't wait for their art class. So then she says, welcome to art. And they walk in, and we've watched her class. They know exactly what table to go to. Kindergarten kids who have not been in that room for two weeks know exactly what table to go to. And we watch them take inventory of the art supplies on the table, and then they begin. And while they're doing their hands-on activities, there's no bumping or shoving or pushing or spilling of anything. You know why? Because he, she has her classroom floor marked off in pathways with arrows indicating the flow of traffic. And the students know the procedures in the classroom. They have a wonderful time. Here's another one, September 2002. How to dispense materials in 15 seconds and get everything back at the end of the classroom period with nothing broken or stolen. That's right. Read that one. That's a procedure students are taught. And then go to October 2000. It's about Wanda Bradford. She's a principal in Bakersfield, California. And Wanda Bradford calls us one day and says, Harry and Rosemary, I want to thank you. I have just had the most wonderful, smooth running first day of school I've ever seen in my entire life. And we said, what did you do? She said, I took your video series, and many of you have seen it. Uh, there are eight videos in the series. And she said, I showed tape number three and four. I will show the rest later on. And at the end of the video, my teachers all said the same thing. Of course, of course, common sense. We need consistency. So as the students go from room to room, they all know what to do. And we support and help each other. And so we all agreed on three or four school-wide procedures, one of which is there will be an assignment, a bell work assignment on the board when the students walk in. So picture now, student walks into your classroom, there's a bell work assignment, they sit down, they get to work. I mean, what else do you want? The bell rings, they go to another class, there's an assignment on the board, they sit down, they get to work. They walk into another class, the teacher's there greeting over the door, they walk in, they sit down, they get to work. And that becomes the prevailing culture at your school. And we haven't spent a single penny. We haven't shuffled anyone's schedule. And I haven't tampered with anyone's philosophy or approach to teach. All we have done is gotten everyone to work together as a team in a learning community to support and help each other. And the benefactors of this entire thing are the students. As a sixth grade boy told me, who goes to school in an at-risk community, a, a school that is located in an at-risk community. The school is not at risk. The community is. He said, I love coming to this school. Why? Because everyone knows what to do. You see, that's procedures. Procedures has to do with doing. Whereas the ineffective teacher is preoccupied with behavior, discipline, this one. That's all they talk about. Whereas the effective teachers are always talking about what kids are doing, doing, achieving, achieving, accomplishing, accomplishing. And the only way you can get people to accomplish and achieve is you teach them what to do. There are procedures. And so this boy said, I love coming to school because everyone knows what to do. No one yells and screams at us, and we can get on with learning. And that's exactly what Wanda Bradford has done at her school, and her kids have achieved remarkably. The same column, October 2000, is about Pam Hawkins. She's the principal of a middle school, a junior high school. And what, they, what all the teachers did at the beginning of the school year is they all got together and they agreed on a blueprint for success, which is just a fancy way of saying they agreed on five procedures school-wide. Number one was all the students would be in their seats by the tardy bell working on the assignment. Number two, they all agreed to spend some money to buy a book, an agenda book. They then taught the students the procedure of how to write their assignments down so they could keep track of their assignments. And at the end of the school year, 51% oh, of the students made the student body in the first year of operation. And Pam Hawkins says, I attribute it to the consistent implementation of school-wide procedures. Here's another one. January 2002. It's about Bridgette Phillips and her school. When we met her, she had not lost a teacher in seven years. No one leaves her. They're happy there. All right, why? School-wide procedures. Go to that website. You'll see, you'll see the entire school-wide procedure plan that they use at her school. And my advice to everyone is steal. Steal from everyone. But it's not stealing, it's sharing. 
And that's how why these people succeed. They go on the internet, on, on teachers.net or in the book, and just see what other people are doing and simply adapt what other people are doing. You don't run around trying to put out one fire after another after another. You need to have a classroom management plan that is all-encompassing. And so my last example is August 2007, which is not coming up yet. It is going to come up. In the August 2007 column, I'm going to write about Almo Sanchez. Almo Sanchez wrote us a letter in which he said, I want to tell you about my evolution from being an ineffective teacher to an effective teacher. He said he was hired to teach in this elementary school, fifth grade language arts, ESE inclusion, ESOL. So he had some challenging kids. And he said, uh, on my first academic school year, I struggled. Uh, my students spoke throughout the classroom. Uh, they wandered around the room. And he said, I soon found out I was using my loud and angry voice, and I would go home angry, and my family felt the direct effects. At the end of the school year, I reflected on my class, and I realized I was not too successful. He even labeled himself a failure or an ineffective teacher, because, and he knew his classroom lacked structure. And as a professional, he was disappointed himself, he says, and I needed to make some changes. By luck, he said, uh, the school system, and this is Miami, they have a summer conference, and I signed up. And he can remember the day. It was Friday, June 9, and I was sitting in this auditorium thinking to myself, is this going to be another one of those long in-service presentations that I'm going to have to endure? Well, he says the answer was no. He says I was captivated. Harry Wong and Shalanda Soroya were presenting their plan on classroom management. And then, as he says, I had a light bulb moment. I sat there, and I could visualize the strategies that would get me back to improving the way I teach. He said, I could visualize the whole thing, and by the end of the se seminar, changes were already running through my mind. I went home, and I stole these ideas. I stole Shalanda Soroya's procedures and everything else. And on June 9, he says, my life as a professional teacher was transformed. He said, it took me a month to develop my classroom management PowerPoint. But he says, now picture this. It's now Monday, August 14, the first day of the second year of my teaching. And what a difference. I opened the door at 8.15, greeted my students with an extended right hand. I shook the student's hand. I said, welcome to our class. I am glad you are here. My students greeted me back with warm smiles. I projected the bell work assignment as a PowerPoint presentation. And by the time I closed the door, there was silence in the classroom, and all of my students were actively working. I could not believe it. After the students completed the bell work, I introduced my students to, myself to the students, and I used the PowerPoint point presentation to explain my class. By the end of the day, my students were following the classroom procedures, and when the dismissal bell rang at the end of the day, no one got up. They all waited for me to dismiss them, and it was only the first day of school. By the end of the day, peace was with me. I had an upbeat attitude. I went home happy. For the first time in my professional career, I had a feeling that what was missing from my life for a long time had come back. My family noticed the difference in me, and I liked the new, happier me. I came to love my profession after the first day of school. And my students felt safe in the classroom atmosphere that I had created. Last year, I was a stressed out teacher with a chaotic classroom. Now I feel that I'm an effective teacher with a structured classroom. My students are happy to come to my classroom. The parents are asking, what are you doing that causes my child to become so engaged in your class? My child wants to come to your class even though they are sick. My secret recipe is having a structured classroom procedures. And it's signed Elmo Sanchez, Miami, Florida. And so, if you get your procedures in place, you will now have time to devote yourself to the art and craft of teaching and become the effective teacher your students need and want and they deserve. Okay, Marianne, I've uh, probably
probably talk too long, but I've given lots of lots of references. That's what I want to do. Well, those, those are just great heartwarming examples, Harry. And if I can even bring my own example, I had been teaching, I've been teaching 17 years here in Ontario, and I'd never ever heard of Harry Wong or the first days of school until my my principal gave me your book. And our superintendent had ordered your videos, and I was going to a, a brand new teaching assignment, and I just lapped up your videos. I, I think I saw each one of them twice, and I read and reread your book. And that first day, you know, I had my procedures in place, and it was it was a fantastic year, one of the one of the best. And now those students are already in in uh, in grade grade twelve and uh, going on to to college, university next year, and. And they still come up to me because my, my daughter goes to the same high school where these students are now. And they all say that it was the best year they've ever had. And, and I owe it to you, Harry. I mean, those procedures work for the, for the, uh, the rookie teacher and also for you know, veteran teachers. I'm, I'm still learning stuff. I mean, you've got so much stuff in that book. <laughs> Sometimes I curse you that you've got so much material. <laughs> Oh. Maria, what's even, uh, when you say so much stuff, uh, we get so many letters from people on the Clear Blue Sky thanking us. And we write back and say, send us your plan. I mean, show us what you've done to succeed. And they gladly send it to us. And many people have converted their power of their procedures from paper into PowerPoint. And so we get them. I have a whole drawer full of them. And my problem every month is when Rosemary and I write the column for Teachers.net, which one do we pluck out? I mean, uh, it's amazing how many people have implemented uh, what we have said. And I guess that's the message of this interview. Uh, we're not here to solve your specific problem or some kid you have. What I'd rather do is to show you what other people have done and how they themselves have implemented uh, for, for student success. And, and I like your example about the script. I mean, you know, football coaches, you know, hockey coaches, baseball coaches, they have a plan. They all have a plan. You know, business leaders have a plan. Uh, why don't teachers have, you know, a, a good solid plan in place? Well, I even go further than that. Uh, uh, when you have a wedding. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's been a year <laughs> for that wedding. And, you know, there's the wedding coordinator standing at the back of the church with the script in her hand. That's right. You know, you go here, you go there, you do this, you do that. She's got a script. And it, it's a, one year was spent planning for that script for a wedding ceremony that's going to take 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but, boy, those 15 minutes are the most important minutes for a bride and groom. That's right. And it's the same thing in the classroom. Boy, you better prepare for those first five minutes in your classroom. Because if you bomb on those first five minutes, you're dead for the rest of the year. Yeah, you're absolutely right. right. But here, yeah. uh, Marin, it's not too late. I know people say, why didn't I hear this when I began teaching? Or it's now March or November. Why didn't I hear you back in August? To which my answer is, the nicest thing about education is you get to start all over again. Yeah. See, you can't do that if you're a mortician. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you can't do that if you're a salesperson. You've lost the sale. You've lost the sale. You know, yeah. as a teacher, you can start all over again. So for those of you listening, my suggestion is you'll say to yourself tonight, what is it I want my students to do? Just pick one thing, one procedure. Okay, don't say no. Whatever you say, if I can only get them to behave, that's not, that's not the point. What is it you want them to do? And then, you know, it's all in Chapter 20 or Unit um, C. Uh, learn how to teach a procedure, and you walk in, you simply say, uh, I'm going to teach you a procedure. <laughs> and they'll probably look at you and say, what works? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but you walk in and um, look at Karzim's PowerPoint, how he introduces himself, how he explains what a procedure is, and then how he teaches a procedure. And just teach one procedure starting tomorrow and do it the next day and the next day and the next day. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And then the following week, install another one. And the following week, install another one. And I guarantee after four to six weeks, they'll have a smooth running classroom. Now keep all these procedures so in the next semester or the next block period or in the next school year begins, you have this entire plan, this entire script ready for implementation during the next school year. That's right. All, all change is incremental. Oh, great. Well, you ready for another question? Oh, I, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, m many of the questions we, we had had to do with improving student learning. What, what are your comments or suggestions as to how we can do that? 
Well, I thank all of you who asked those questions because obviously you you know bottom line why we were all hired. We're all hired not so much to uh, manage a classroom or to maintain discipline. I mean, if you're still trying to maintain discipline, you're kind of still far back in the woods, okay? Uh, your first job is to learn how to manage a classroom so that number two, and Marianne's question is, so the kids can learn. They've all come to school because they want to learn, the parents want them to learn, and the bottom line is at the end of the day, you want to walk out of the building with a smile on your face saying, whatever it is I taught them, they learn, and I'm happy with myself. And whether you want to do it or not, many places have standards that are forcing you to get the kids to learn. But why do we have to force people to teach people, students to learn? I mean, that's why school is there. So again, uh, let me just share with you. I'm going to give you some resources. But uh, let me just say it again now. There's another reason why I've chosen not to answer questions. I've told you previously why I no longer. But the problem with answering many of your questions is almost all of them gave me no background. I don't know your situation, and you just throw a question. You say, I have a student who's doing this. What do I do? Or I have this, this situation. What do I do? I don't know your background. Uh, if you ever go to a doctor's office, have you ever noticed the doctor asks you a battery of questions? In fact, you know the questions that are coming. You probably could say, here, you sit down. I'll play doctor. I'll go to that sheet and ask you the question. You know you're going to be asked a battery of questions, but you also know why those questions are being asked, because the doctor is assessing your health. And by assessing your health by a series of questions, the doctor then can prescribe medicine or treatment to further your good health. And so with no background, it was kind of difficult for me to, uh, to answer questions. Uh, I oftentimes will say to a teacher who writes to me on the email with a with a, with a problem, I say, um, I'd love to help you, but before I can help you, would you send me your classroom management plan? Seriously, no. No one has ever sent me their plan. Uh -huh. Over 10 years, no one has ever sent me their plan. Do you begin to see the problem? It's not the teacher's problem. The problem is there's no plan to proactively stop these problems from happening. And so, same thing in the classroom. Why are the kids failing? Why aren't they learning? Well, let me share with you, there are two reasons why students get low grades. Number one, they do not know what the procedures are. They do not know how the class functions, and so therefore they cannot do what they're supposed to do. And number two, the reason students get low grades is because they do not know what they're supposed to learn. That is to say, there are no objectives for the lesson. So number one, there are no procedures used to manage a classroom, and there are no objectives that tell the kids what they are responsible for learning or for doing in the classroom. For instance, uh, I saw a teacher, in fact, uh, this is not a teacher, this is more than one teacher. I've seen this rather often. I walked in, and this teacher was covering the textbook. Uh, covering the, okay, students, we're going to do chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four. I don't run this classroom. McGraw-Hill runs this classroom. <laughs> and then he wrote the exam the night before, you know, looking for questions at random out of the textbook. But the exam didn't make any sense. He graded the students on a curve. And then he complains to me that the kids were not learning. He didn't want to study. Then he turns to me and he says, Harry, what can I do to motivate these kids? The kids were not the problem. It's what the teacher was doing to demotivate them. Well, you see, kids want to succeed. You've got to enter that classroom with a sense that everyone wants to succeed. And good teachers know how to motivate the students by telling them up front exactly what they're going to learn. So if you will go to Unit D in my book, you will see that I give my students an assignment, and it's called Your Study Guideline. In other words, I'm your friendly guide, and I'm going to guide you through your study of this lesson. And on that piece of paper are written a series of objectives. In other words, I tell my students, this is your assignment. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to learn. Now, students, here's the best part. While you're going to learn these sentences, I never use the word objective, I am going to be teaching you the same sentences. Uh, listen to that one again now. While you are trying to learn these sentences and do this work, I am going to be teaching you the same sentences. That is, when the student and the teacher are moving towards the same goal, that's when you get learning. Or, or as 
I tell my students, since you know what you ought to learn, and I'm going to help you learn what you need to learn, how can you possibly fail this classroom? Wow. So, uh, here's some resources to show you how it's done. Please go to April 2006. Her name is Judy Johnson. She's a teacher in Minnesota. And the article is entitled, They Are Eager to Do the Assignment. Uh-huh. They are eager to do the assignment. And you can read the column and see what she does. And you can see why they are eager. And this is basically what Judy Johnson does. She says, the first thing I do is I decide what I want my student to learn. Notice what she, what she says. She doesn't say, oh, I'm going to give them this worksheet. I'm going to deliver this lecture. I'm going to have them read this chapter. I'm going to play this game. I'm going to sing this song. You know, busy work, busy work, busy work. She says, I decide what it is I want them to learn. In other words, she states her objective for the lesson. Then number two, she then shows them what they are to learn. That is, she teaches what she wants them to learn. Then after she teaches them, step number three, they then practice what she has taught them to learn. And not only practice it together, they then practice it on their own. This is called guided practice followed by independent practice. And then number four, she says, I then test them on what I told them they are to learn. In other words, the questions do not come out of left field. There are no surprises. The students all know the procedure for how they're going to be tested. And she says, when I use this method, they all succeed. And so what I'm saying to you is simply this. Uh, if students know what they are to learn, you greatly increase the chances that the students will learn. So the effective teacher, number one, has a lesson with objective to focus the students on what they are to learn. Number two, the objectives are aligned to a state or district standard. Standards are wonderful. I don't know where you hear this, but some people say standards stifle your creativity. Hardly, hardly. When you build a home, you take your plans to the city for approval. The city is only looking to see if the plumbing, the electricity, the structure, the roof, and other things have made, met standards of safety and construction. They do not in any way tell you how to build a house. But once you've met those standards of construction and materials, you can then create any kind of beautiful house you want. And that's the same thing in education. They will simply tell you what are some basic standards that it's up to you to creatively build something. And in the state of Minnesota, where Julie Johnson teaches, one of the standards is simply get the kids to know some basic, simple shapes. You know, like triangles and circles and so forth. That's all they tell you. Who's against that? How does that stifle your creativity? Now read the column, and you'll see how she teaches that standard in a very exciting way. Then step number three, your lesson then must have activities. And that's why I say look at what Julie Johnson does. The activities must match the objective, which in turn is aligned to state standards. See, the reason many students are not learning is because the students come and, what are we going to do today? And the teacher says, well, I went home last night, and I had to find something to keep this class quiet and busy. Of course they're not learning. And then number four, the effective teacher has a test that allows you to assess for whether they are learning or not. Now, notice the word, assess. You don't grade the students. I use the analogy of a doctor. When you go to a doctor's office, the doctor runs tests on you. And the, the results of the test come back, such as the blood test. Does the doctor look at the results and then give you a grade from A to F? No. The doctor uses the assessment of the blood test, the numbers and so forth, to assess the next series of medicine or treatment to get your health back up to where you want it. And that's exactly what good teachers do. Good teachers are always assessing for learning. So when you give a test, what you're trying to determine is, have they learned it? Have they learned it? Have they learned it? Have they learned it? And if not, what am I going to do? Now, this is what else good teachers do. I want you to go to October 2006 and read about Norm Dannon. Uh, and also, I want you to go to November 2006. So that's October 2006, Norm Dannon, and November 2006, Aretha Ferguson. They are both high school English teachers, 
English has nothing to do with it. High school has nothing to do with it, okay? Norm Dannon taught uh, the state standard in New Jersey on English. The students are supposed to know words and symbols and things so they can have fluency and comprehension when they read, of course. And then Aretha Ferguson had a lesson on prose poetry. And what they both use are scoring guides. Now, the student is given a study guideline at the beginning of the assignment. And at the beginning of the assignment, you also give the students a scoring guide that explains to the students how they are going to be scored. Now, some of you know the scoring guide. be called a rubric. A scoring guide you see when you watch the Olympics or an ice skating event or Dancing with the Stars or any of these events. And when the judge holds up a number, the judge is not giving you a grade. What the judge is doing is telling you how close you came to perfection. And so the contestants will practice and practice and practice and practice and practice. And at the end of the routine, they sit down, and the judges then flash up the score. And the judges are simply telling you how close you came to perfection. And so if you will go to February 2007, if for those of you who have never heard of what a rubric is, all of a sudden, when you see what's on February 2007, you will understand what's a scoring guide and how you can get your kids to succeed. You will see a first grade teacher by the name of Kathy Monroe and her rubric or scoring guide. First grade, it's a picture rubric. There are four pictures up on the wall. One is marked excellent, the next one is good, the next one is needs work, and the last one is need lots of work. And the students are eager to work on their assignment. Why? Because as they do their drawings, they come up to the board or the scoring guide or the rubric, whatever you want to call it. And what they're doing is they're comparing their work to the highest standard picture. And of course, everyone is striving, striving to learn to do good. But only if, number one, they know at the beginning of the assignment what they're supposed to learn, and number two, if they only know what they must do to achieve excellence or perfection. Now, go to February 2004. It's about Carol Brooks. She's a South Carolina teacher who teaches middle school at-risk kids, and all of her students do the homework. Uh-huh, you heard me. Well, how does she do it? She has a notebook assignment system. It's all there for you to download. Her students get one sheet of paper. The parents know it, the teachers know it, the kids know it. And she teaches them the procedure of how to complete that assignment. And so 10 seconds, she says, is all it takes for me or our parents to look at it. And we can tell what assignment the kid needs to work on. And that's why my kids are so successful. And then September 2006, I've written a column on 92% homework turn-in rate. You heard me. 92% homework turn-in rate. Read that column, and you'll see how it's done. Uh, this is a technique that Shalanda Soroyer also uses. And remember now, she's a first, second year teacher. That's all. And she does it with success. And so people who know how they're gonna, what the assignment is and people who know how they're going to be scored will succeed. And that's why this student who's in Aretha Ferguson's classroom, that's 2006, November. Andrew Erickson is his name, and he says, having the scoring guide, having the rubric, was like having the poem in front of me. The rubric guided me through the process of writing the poem, when otherwise I would have been clueless. And so you can easily help students, including at-risk students. Many of you wrote and you told me about some of the students, and I could tell they were at-risk students, or they come from an at-risk community, which does not make the student at-risk now. It's just the situation they come from. It's very easy to help an at-risk student, because all an at-risk student needs is structure. That is structure. And what is structure? An organized set of procedures and routines so the students just know how the classroom is run. For instance, many teachers will lecture but do not teach the students how to take lecture notes. There's no structure, no procedure. Many teachers give homework but do not teach the students how to do homework. That's structure. Many students tell the students to read the textbook but do not teach the students how to read the textbook. So if you want to help an at-risk student, there must be structure. Teach the students what to do in your classroom. And here's the part now. If a student who's at risk walks into a classroom that has no structure, you begin to see the problem. 
So you begin to structure your classroom, to structure the classroom of, of your students. And the last thing I want to share with you is um, this past year, an organization in Arizona published a paper in which they said there are some schools with Latino students or who are able to beat the odds, and how do they do it? And one school they mentioned was Kennedy School in Phoenix. And what this report says is that success has little to do with money, class size, fancy reading programs, parent involvement, tutoring, or many of these other fads that we try to use. They say that both of these, all of these can be found in good and bad schools. He says, what separated the good schools from the bad schools? What separated the schools that got kids who were able to beat the odds were the ones who gave their assignments and then assessed and assessed and assessed what the kids did or could not do. And then they met together as teams. That's right. They met together as grade level or subject matter teams. And they had these meetings. And they looked at the results. And they suggested to each other what they might teach. This is not an evaluation of each other. How we could reteach and reteach and reteach. And it said these teachers did not stop until they found a way for every student to grasp the lesson. Okay, Marianne. Wow, that's that, that's great. It it, uh, it brings up the the other question that uh, we had from from a number of teachers, and I know you, you you touched on it. Is you know questions of you know children with with autism and ADD and ADHD and other other special education challenges and mental health challenges. Did you did you want to add any anything to that? Uh, yeah, I want to add something to that. But before I do, I just thought of something. Uh, I know you're in Canada. I went to this meeting in uh, North Carolina this last week, and it was basically for North Carolina people. But there were three visitors from Canada. They come from, down from Alberta uh, to to learn about the uh, new teacher induction, and it was there that I learned about. Uh, the province in Alberta has an Alberta Assessment Council. I'm not sure how to find it. Um, maybe we can find it. But I think if you go to the Alberta Provincial Government's website, they, for the last 10 years, have had an assessment uh, work uh, consortium with some wonderful things that these three people shared with me. And so for those of you who have never heard of assessment, that is, you think that teaching is simply, here's the book, listen to me lecture, here's the worksheet, here's the test. Uh, I don't know of a single professor who's ever said that's the way to teach. The way to teach is you tell the students up front what you want them to learn, then you help them to learn it. And then when you give them the formative test, you simply assess and assess, and then you help and you help. And so that now finishes that one. And so you asked about the... Uh, well, if I can add uh, to Alberta. Alberta consistently ranks at the at the top of our uh, standard standard testing here in Canada. So well, there, there, there is some correlation there, isn't there? <laughs> well, Marianne, I didn't want to say it. Ontario. <laughs> I happen to know that Alberta scores the highest on reading and a few other things. You got it, yeah. Let's face it, come on. Uh, their teachers are no better than your teachers. Uh, you know, as you shared with me, it doesn't take a genius to figure this thing out. Yeah. All you need are, are effective teachers, and no matter where you teach in the world or what province or what state. And the kids are all the same. Kids are kids. Yep. They succeed. Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about that last time you came up here to Canada. You asked me if we if we had these kids in the system, and I said I nodded. I says, "Yep." So what they are? I mean, you've seen them all all over the world. That's right. Okay, so that brings up the question you said. You know, and there were some questions on at-risk students. And, That's right. Yeah. And and children who are in special education with with their special challenges. Yeah, and a lot of them are now being uh, integrated into regular regular classrooms now. That's right. You know, kids with autism, ADD, yeah. ADHD, and. You know, fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, OCD, I mean, it goes on and on. Well, here, here's one. Uh, on procedures, uh, with an autistic child, do not tell a ch uh, an autistic child what to do and expect the child to do it instantly. Uh, with an autistic child, you say to the child, in two minutes, this is what I would like you to do. I would like you to put away your, your spelling book and get out your math book. But you give that child two minutes to mm -hmm. process the instruction. Mm -hmm. Don't expect them to jump. Uh, I've known this for a long time. And then here's a resource, Education Leadership, Ed Leadership. It's a major magazine. February 2007, A New Approach to ADD. It's an excellent article. And here are some of the things that are in the article. Number one, 
organize and get started on tasks. You see, that's why a lot of students are misbehaving in the classroom because the student, the teachers are not organized and uh, they don't know how to task analyze their classroom so the kids all understand how the tasks are to be done, the procedures, the procedure. The article also says attend the details. That's what a procedure is. And avoid excessive dis distractibility. Um, I will even add something else. Uh, some people say, oh, Harry, what can I find exciting to motivate the kids? Whatever you do, don't motivate and excite an ADD kid. <laughs> Lunchtime to calm that kid down. So people say, you know, learning should be fun. I, I gotta do something fun and exciting. Don't do that with an ADD kid. What that kid does not want is an exciting activity. What that kid needs more than anything else is love and care and understanding mm -hmm. and compassion. And another thing the article says: use short-term working memory and access recall. Uh, teachers who deal with these kids know that their lessons need to be very, very short. Get one success piled on top of another success, yeah. and piled on the, on top of another success, one at a time. And so, the reason we have assessment then is to gather information on these kids to see how they're doing, so we know what to do. So here come the references. October 2004. It's a teacher in Ohio by the name of Robin Zarzor. I think her name is Robin Barlack now. She teaches preschool. I mentioned her, I think, already. Yes. She's preschool in Ohio, and these kids are not even in kindergarten. And she's got all these kids with special challenges, and as I already said, they sing their procedures. Um, March 2006, I chronicle the success of three more special ed teachers. Uh, Robin is one of them. Another one is Charlotte, and Charlotte is a teacher in Ontario, right in your province. Uh, uh, she's uh, west of you. And then the last one is a guy named by the name of Dan. He's down in North or South Carolina. So there are three of them here and what they do. But let me uh, end this little section uh, with Jack Rains. Jack Rains is a principal in Virginia. And like you, he heard about our work a few years ago. And he said to us, Harry, by the fifth week of school, I had had 133 referrals. Since implementing your plan this year, by the fifth week, we've had exactly three referrals. So what happened? He said, it's very simple. I simply did what some of these other principals you shared with us did, such as Wanda Bradford. I had a meeting. I showed tape number three and four. Uh, we discussed procedures, and everyone said common sense. See, procedure is not a fighting word. No, it's a common sense. You have to be organized. Uh, as the article says, you've got to be organized. You have your tasks, your details, and don't have anything that distracts the kids. And so they all agreed on some procedures, and that's how they started their uh, new school year. And he said, on the first day of school, by fourth period, the high school students walked into their fourth period class and they said, we know, we know, there's an assignment on the board. We'll sit down, we'll get to work. By fourth period, he had established the culture of the school. And that's why uh, referrals dropped from 133 to 3 that year. Well, I'm not finished with the story of Jack Raines. Uh, his superintendent left. And then a few years later, the superintendent gets a call and says to Jack, would you come to my new school district and take over a school for me? It's an alternative high school. Whoopee. <laughs> Not only was it an alternative high school, it was a combination uh, technical school. So you can picture yourself, uh, picture please, uh, the students who are in this classroom, alternative and technical. And he said the school had a history of no successes, uh, excessive uh, discipline problems, failures, everything, the whole chronicle. He said by the first grading period, 20 of the 24 students made the honor roll. And by the end of the school year, 67% of the students who had come for one semester made the honor roll. And he said, now remember, these kids had in previous years never succeeded. What was the, what was the uh, secret? We simply installed what our teachers believe in is the first day of school uh, plan. We had a plan, and everyone knew the plan. 
guarantee. So he says, now that's the good news. Now here's the bad news. The bad news is we have become the school of choice. They don't want to go back there. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, Jack Raines. Okay, got another question? Oh, that's great. Well, yes, I've got one, one more for you. And it happens to, to deal with the mentoring process. Uh, some new teachers were frustrated with the mentoring process and asking you for help. Okay, um, I, and I, let me tell you, I could not agree with you more in your frustration with mentoring, and I'll tell you why. Now, here's the reference, www.newteacher.com. And when you get to newteacher.com, you will find lots and lots of articles about how to help new teachers. In fact, if any of you are thinking of doing a, a master's paper or a doctoral dissertation, and you want the bibliography, I've got chapter two done for you already. <laughs> because in this website, you will find all the resources that you can use in your bibliography that anyone has ever done on the subject of new teacher induction or mentoring. Uh, begin with the article that appears right at the beginning called Significant Research and Readings on Comprehensive Induction. And this is what it will tell you. First, it will tell you that there's absolutely no research to support that if you give a teacher a mentor, then that te new teacher will be an effective teacher. And this has been going on for 30 to 40 years. We think that the way to succeed with teachers is just to give them a buddy or a mentor. Now, first, we agree that a new teacher should have a mentor, somebody they can go to for help. I don't disagree with that one bit. But the problem is many of these mentors are simply there to help you survive. What they do is not aligned to any district or school curriculum or mission or vision. They're simply there to help you survive. And so what works then? What works is if you go to teachers.net, May, June 2005, or April 2007, which is going to come up in a, a couple of weeks, or if you listen to this thing later on, don't worry. Just go to April 2007, and you will find some articles on what is comprehensive new teacher induction. If you want a new teacher to succeed, they must have more than a mentor. That's what we're saying. Richard Ingersoll of the University of Pennsylvania has done his research, and he says that if you want new teachers to succeed, they must have, have at least seven components to help them succeed. Yes, give them a mentor. Number two, they must be able to see other teachers teach. We call these demonstration classrooms. There's an organization, it's a group of people at Harvard University called the, uh, the, the Project on the Next Generation of Teachers. They looked at some teachers in the state of Massachusetts and 97% of them said, yes, we have a mentor. But only 17% said they ever walked into another classroom to watch another teacher teach. Also, they said, their mentors, many of them, never came into my classroom to watch me teach. They were only available if I could find them after school to help. So ask yourself, what good is a mentor if a mentor never watched you teach? And what good is a mentor if you're never allowed to watch other teachers teach so you can ask questions of the other teacher or the mentor? But a comprehensive induction program allows for class visitations. And the next component is most important. Right now, what's coming into our classrooms is called the Y generation. These are the teachers who are under 30 years old who have a totally different lifestyle and culture. They are not the me generation. They are the generation that knows how to work in a flat world. They have access to the computer. They have access to the whole world. They know how to work with everyone else. They are in a sharing profession. It does not work to give them a one-to-one -one mentor. It's much better to put them in groups of people where they can share information with each other, feel like they're contributing to school, and have some kind of common goals to work towards improving the education of kids. A learning community is their forte. Thus, to work collaboratively in a group is very second nature to them. And then there are all kinds of other things that you can do in a comprehensive induction program, and I've given you some resources as to how you can find it. So for those of you frustrated with the mentoring process, you should be, because what you should have been given is a comprehensive induction program. 
And Marianne, I hate to tell you this, but uh, that's what they have in Alberta. Hmm. Yeah. And what you guys have in Ontario is strictly a mentoring program. And so if you look around the world, look around some countries, and go to those websites, you'll see what is a comprehensive induction program. Now, I'm not saying that Ontario is doing it wrong. Uh, it's fine to have a mentor, but these teachers need more than a mentor. Yeah, and, and you're right. The um, the mentor really doesn't get freed up to see how the, the other teacher is teaching. And, yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. Anything else? Well, I mean, I'm going to turn it, turn it back over to you for any final comments. Well, believe it or not, I've got a couple. You still have some more in you. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, I get two. A couple means two. So I've got two. Uh, let, me, let me do the first one. Uh, it was only one person who asked this question. but uh, So maybe I shouldn't even answer the question, but I don't want to leave anybody out. Uh, but since it was only one person, why am I answering this question? Well, let me share with you. This question is asked of me over and over and over and over again. I've been asked this for over 10 years. In fact, when I came home this weekend, I found the same question on the Internet from someone else. And that is, a high school teacher will say, Harry, when are you going to write a book for us high school teachers? Or they will say, Harry, your book looks so elementary. Well, let me answer that one, okay? First, I am a high school teacher. I'm very proud that I'm a high school teacher. Uh, so I'd like to talk to the high school people. <laughs> <laughs> first thing I want you to do is look at the cover of the book. That's the first thing, the school. And notice on the cover uh, that there are some high school teachers pictured on the book. So I'm not quite sure what people mean when they say the book looks so elementary. The most predominant picture on the cover of the book is next to your picture. Now, for those of you <laughs> on your website, they don't know that Naran Glossing is on the cover of the book. He's over on the left-hand side, standing there with a flute, uh, and his daughter, yes. And next to Marianne and his daughter is his teacher leaning over with a white shirt and a red tie. That's Jim Heinz. He's a high school English teacher. And in the bottom left-hand corner is, uh, is a high school computer teacher. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, the guy with the eyeglasses, is a high school science teacher out of Michigan. <laughs> and the very first teacher quoted in the book, in the preface, is a high school teacher. And as I, and if you go into the book in Unit D, we just finished talking about assignments, my assignments are in there from my old high school science class. My old high school tests are in there from my old <laughs> high school class. I mean, I'm a high school teacher. The book is full of high school examples. So. Uh, and so whenever I hear people tell me, I need a book for high school, or the book looks so elementary, I write back and I very gingerly say, I would love to help you. I'm going to revise my book. And this book has been revised two or three times already. It's probably due for another one soon. I said, oh, I need your help. Tell me what it is about the book that makes you say it's an, it's an elementary book, a book for elementary. What is it that I can put in that would help you as a high school teacher? Ten years I've been asking that question. I asked that question last week of somebody else. I never get an answer. <laughs> so I, I can't figure out. For those of you listening, please help me. What is it about the book that makes you think it's for elementary school teachers only? And what is it that I can write that would only help you? Well, the point I want to make is this. Classroom management and student learning applies to everyone. K-12. All right. It applies to everyone. You mean to tell me that uh, you don't need a procedure, high school teacher, you don't need a procedure for the kids to come in on time and get to work? You're telling me that all high school kids are never tardy to classroom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you mean high school students don't need a, a signal or procedure to come to attention, that they automatically all give you their attention? Uh, you are trying to tell me that high school students are never tardy? They never break a pencil? Oh, and of course, you don't have any fire drills or disaster drills. And if you don't believe that, recently we had a tornado that wiped out the or Enterprise Alabama High School. You better have procedures. Uh, you, you high school teachers, you need procedures for an assignment or taking a test so that you can do an assessment of these kids. And for this, please read February and March 2007. 
and read about Karen Rogers, high school teacher from Kansas. Now the next one is November 2000. How high school teachers start the first five minutes of class. The next one is November 2001. The title of the article is The Effective Teacher Thinks. It's about Steve Guyman, an absolutely phenomenal high school physical education teacher. That's right, a PE teacher thinks and can implement what's in the book. And watch how he runs his class. He not only runs his PE class incredibly smoothly and efficiently, he also now is a consultant. He goes out and he teaches teachers, regardless of what they teach, how to implement procedures to manage a classroom. Here's a wonderful resource. February 2002. The teacher's name is Liz Bro. She teaches in a at-risk school, I mean really at-risk school, in a middle school in Louisiana, and she gets all of her students up to grade level on reading within a year or two, and they don't sit there and they don't give her any problems. She does not leave at the end of the day with any stress. How does she do it? Read that article. So as far as I'm concerned, middle, junior, and senior high school, you're all secondary teachers. It applies to everyone. October 2002. It's about five foreign language teachers. Four of the five are high school foreign language teachers. Look at their plan and what they do and what these high school teachers get do to get their students to succeed. November 2002. It's about two high school band teachers. And as they say, we have four, three, two, three, four hundred students standing out there in the field and as they say, with noise makers in their hands. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, we can quiet them down in one second. Yes, high school teachers. Oh, well, here's my favorite one. May 2004. May 2004. We've written about this guy over and over again. His name is Jeff Smith. He is a welding teacher. Now, nowhere in our book do we say anything about how to teach welding. Well, we don't even say a word about how to teach music or special ed or English or anything, but he teaches welding. And how good is he? In the past seven or eight years, every single one of his students has qualified for the Oklahoma welding certificate. These students can leave high school, his class, and go out into the world and get a job and earn money as a certified licensed welder. He has not, not a single student has ever failed his class. So how did he do it? As he says, I implemented your work. So you see, high school teachers, it's all there for you to implement. And then, of course, November 2004 is Karzim Chichek. I mentioned that one previously. February 2005, that's Shalanda Soroyer. She's the high school English teacher. March 2005, I've already done that one. That's Ed Lucero, high school business teacher. May and October 2006. There were two articles I wrote about Norm Dannon, high school English teacher. November 2006, Aretha Ferguson, high school English teacher. And here's the best one. December 2006, two college professors. Yes. We recently heard from a college professor in Texas who says, I use your program. I teach the teachers in my classroom management class, how to manage the classroom, and I also use the same procedures to manage my college <laughs> classroom. And so for those of you who are looking for resources to help you, uh, let me share with you. I know I've thrown a lot of resources out at you, and your, your head is swirling. You say, it's going to take me forever to, to go through all of these things. There's seven years of columns you guys have written, you two have written. Well, let me share with you, there is an easy way to get this thing done. Uh, for those of you who are in leadership positions and you're trying to help your teachers to become effective teachers, uh, we have a video series I mentioned. It. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Marianne has seen it. It's called The Effective Teacher. Is it on DVD now, Harry? Uh, it's on DVD now. Yeah, okay. uh, in fact, you can't get it anywhere with it, <laughs> but DVD. Uh, use this to, I might say, uh, inspire your teachers to, to do what I've been talking about. It's a great inspiration. 
Uh, the second thing is uh, now we're coming to what's new and up-to-date, especially what appeals to the uh, Y generation. Much of this has now been put online. It's called www.classroommanagement.com. Rosemary and I have created an online course on classroom management. Uh, it's not free. Everything I've shared with you today has been free. This one's, it's, it's nominal cost, but you know, it's, it's a great investment in your future. And what happens is when you sign up for this course, you will get a blank binder. See, that this is Sarah John Dahl's influence on our life, the, the young teacher who graduated from university and came into teaching with a binder full of materials. What we will do is uh, furnish you with a binder once you sign up for the course. And it will take about 20 hours to work your way through this course. Uh, it's rather exciting. It's uh, very graphic and it's very up to date. And you will put together your own classroom management plan, your own, that you can use no matter where you go to teach. And after 20 hours or more, it will take at least 20 hours if not more, you will complete your own classroom management action plan binder. So that's www.classroommanagement.com. Now, for those of you who want three units for having taken the class, you can get three college credit uh, by simply contacting the publisher and finding out who you can go to, where you can be referred to, to get three uh, graduate credits. And so uh, I would like all of you to share with me. I've been sharing with all of you now with all these resources. And if you're wondering how Harry and Rosemary are able to write these columns, it's very simple. People share these share their successes with us. So please share your successes with us. Start a dialogue with us. You don't have to just write and tell us that you heard me and you have something you may want to share, and we'll write back to you. Uh, and the point is this now, and I make this in my book. Uh, when you try these things, some of them may work for you, they may not work for you. So you obviously you tweak it and you tinker with it until it works. The point I want to make is this. People who know what to do, you know, you go in the classroom, you do it. And people even know how to do it will always be working for someone who knows why it is being done. And that's the reason the first days of school book is so valuable. It will give you the research reason behind why you are doing what you're doing and explains what you are doing, how you're doing it, and the research reason behind it. So, Marianne, that's the first part of what you said. Is there any closing comments I have to make? And I have one last closing comment to make, and that is, in the questions that came to you, I wish, I wish somebody had asked the question about Harry. Can you uh, say something about the importance and dignity and value of the teaching profession or as teachers? Because every day we just get bombarded by the press, by the public, by parents maybe about what's wrong with education. I mean. I hate to go to parties. I hate to go on airplanes. I, I don't talk to anyone on airplanes because if I tell, if somebody says that, what do you do for a living, I cringe if I have to tell them I'm a teacher because they just jump on you and say, what's wrong with education? I mean, everybody's been brainwashed that something's wrong with education. Uh, and so, since so, nobody asked me that question, I'm going to make up an answer <laughs> and just simply say, uh, the school does not begin, my fellow colleagues, until you and I walk into the classroom. And the research is overwhelming. Over 200 studies have said that the only way that we will ever have consistent student achievement is with a knowledgeable, skillful teacher. That is, the teacher must know an awful lot. And you, so you keep stealing and stealing and learning and learning and learning. And number two, you've got to know what to do. And that's what I've been sharing with you today. Lots of people know what to do. And I'm sure that if you steal and learn from these people, you too will have the knowledge and skills to become an effective teacher. And so when they walk in the classroom, what they want is an effective teacher, which is the subtitle of the book, The First Days of School, and our column, which is available free on teachers.net, The Effective Teacher. These kids need effective teachers. There's a lot in the press about qualified teachers. There's the difference between a qualified teacher and an effective teacher. A qualified teacher is simply someone who has a college degree and has majored in the subject that he or she is teaching, but that does not necessarily make that person an effective teacher. So we want effective teachers in the classroom. And when the teachers walk in the classroom, we do not ask these kids if they're in the country legally or illegally. 
We do not ask them if they had breakfast this morning. We do not ask them if their parents beat them up last night. We accept them. We love them. We cherish them. We care for them. And we teach them. Why? Because we are teachers. People who have chosen a very noble profession. And so please go to January 2001 on teachers.net and I want you to proudly read The Miracle of Teachers. Then I want you to go to February 2006 and read a column entitled What Teachers Have Accomplished. And when you finish, you'll be very, very proud that you have chosen teaching as a profession. So when you walk into your classroom tomorrow, please understand that you may be the only stable adult these kids will ever see in their lifetime. You may be their only hope and dream for a brighter tomorrow. You are the window to which they will see the world. And I know many of you say you went into teaching because you want to make a difference. Please let me qualify. You don't make a difference. You are the difference. Thanks, Marianne, for asking me to share this day with you. Well, Harry, on, on behalf of all teachers, thank you for sharing your wisdom, your insights, and especially your time with us. Thank you very, very much. It has been my genuine pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Great. Thank you very much.